The Christadelphians present This Is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Hello, my name is Dave Jennings, and welcome to This Is Your Bible. Today we have a very interesting discussion that we're looking forward to. It's going to be centered around the life of Joseph. Now, I'm sure you've heard about Joseph. You've heard about the highs and the lows that he had throughout his life. But we're going to be looking at his life to try to learn more about our own lives and the life that a believer has that goes through times of difficulty as well as times that are pretty good. We're going to be looking specifically at what the Apostle Paul wrote when he said that all things work together for good for those that love God. What does this mean in Joseph's life, and what does it mean in ours? So we'd like you to stay with us. We'll be right back in just a moment. I don't know what your idea of paradise is. We all have our own views on the subject, but I think that most would agree the scenes we are looking at could be described as a touch of paradise. The Creator made this earth a paradise originally, and then mankind spoiled it by trying to do things his own self-centered way. Mankind has ever since tried to create his own paradise, one in which man is glorified and the Creator is forgotten. All around us we can see grim reminders of the remoteness of paradise, reminders that man without God cannot bridge that distance to the true paradise. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we're told that the original creation made by God was very good. We are also told that throughout the Bible that the world will be very good again when Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In Psalm 72 it says, He, Christ, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him that has no helper. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. In Isaiah 35, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the book of Revelation there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is what the Bible has to say about the good things to come. You can learn more about the message of the Bible and your part in God's plan by signing up for our free online Bible courses at thisisyourbible.com. Just click on the Learn More tab and register for Exploring the Bible. Yes, the Bible does tell us that there will be a true paradise here, again, on earth, soon. Will you be ready? Welcome back. We said that our topic today would be looking at the life of Joseph and that we specifically would be looking at this phrase that's used by the Apostle Paul, which is that all things work together for good for those that love God. Now we're very pleased today to have uh, visiting with us Russell McLeod. Russell will be talking on this subject and uh, first of all, welcome Russell. Thanks Dave, good to be here. Good. Uh, this is a really uh, timely subject because you know it does seem that sometimes things just don't go the way you always want them to go uh, whenever you're a believer. And why is it that you decided to talk about Joseph in this regard? Um, I think that he can hold, he's a very good example for us. And by looking at the challenges in his life, we can see that those are very similar to many of the challenges that we may encounter. Um, and it prevents us from asking the question, why me? Uh, we, it keeps a positive focus in our lives. Yeah, I've, I, I think we've all been there, haven't we? We've mm -hmm. always said, why does this have to happen to me? I'm a believer. Why does bad things, why do bad things happen to people? So mm -hmm. ultimately, you feel that we'll be able to see in the life of Joseph uh, that things did work out for, uh, for good for him. Yeah, I think that if he, um, among, among many other characters that we read about in the Bible, had a vision, he had a focus in front of him as to what was going to happen in his life. And that was what, able, what enabled him to... Uh, remain concrete in his path and, and staying um, within God's commandments and following those. Great. Okay, now this is Joseph. He was, um, uh, his forefather would have been Abraham mm -hmm. and then Isaac 
and then Jacob would have been his father. That's correct. Uh, he was uh, born to Rachel and to, and to Jacob. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what happened at the beginning of his life uh, that uh, really was starting off so well? Yeah, he had, uh, he had some very challenging family dynamics. There were um, kind of two families that were split, and they, these sisters were rivaling against each other, Leah and Rachel, who were um, daughters of Laban. And um, there was a lot of tension uh, between the sons. Um, Joseph, in particular, was the firstborn of Rachel, uh, only one of two children that she had. And, she was, and he was highly favored um, by Jacob. And the other brothers um, were discontent with him. They didn't like him for it. In fact, he had a coat of many colors, I believe, that yep. was given to him by his father Jacob. Mm -hmm. That must not have made his brothers very happy. No, not a bit, because that coat represented um, status and kind of a, a priestly authority uh, within the family. And so, to have imagine yourself having your younger brother placed in a position over you, even though he was many times younger than you, would be pretty difficult. Okay. So, uh, what, is, what would you like to start with in the, in the life of uh, Joseph? Well, as you mentioned earlier, I'd like to look back at uh, the passage in Romans, oh, the, okay. the Apostle Paul, and just have that as the overlying context uh, for, for our discussion today. Um, and we read about that in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And it's this purpose that, that I want to talk about with Joseph today, that we have uh, King David, originally started off as a shepherd. Elisha uh, was an ox herder. Right? He was uh, plowing in the field when God called him. Uh, Samuel was a stable boy. All of these people had mediocre, you might even say obscure beginnings, and they were called to a great service. Okay. So we know then at this particular time that uh, he starts off as a, um, as a young man, as a shepherd, uh, and he is um, not the oldest of the brethren then at this particular no. time. And that's kind of the introduction that we have. Uh, if we go turn back to uh, Genesis, towards the end of the chapter here, in, uh, in 37, uh, we have our first introduction to him. He's a 17-year-old he's a boy, and he receives this vision. Uh, and I'd like to, to read about that here in verses, um, starting in verse 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream, which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said unto him, Shall thou indeed reign over us? Shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dream and for his words. And he actually had a second dream uh, that took place after that where he was represented as um, a star and then the sun and the moon and the eleven stars um, bowed to him as well. And it was challenging for even his father to hear that. And he wasn't sure what it meant, but he, he pondered it and kept it in his mind for future events. I can sh I'm sure this must not have been a very popular thing for him to, uh, to give to his family, that they would be bowing down to him. Right. And you, you, he might have had the tendency to be proud and to be stuck up, um, but as we see, he's, he's very quickly humbled in his life. Okay. So he has these dreams. What happens next? Well, as, as you mentioned before, the, his, his brethren uh, were very jealous of him, and they were off in another part of the country tending after the sheep, because after all, they were, they were shepherds. And um, his father sends Joseph um, to them to find out you know, what's going on, how things are going, because they were in a, in a pasture that was quite a ways away. And the plot develops between the brethren to kill him. And that um, kind of changes as some of them say, you know, no, don't kill him. Um, let's just let's just sell him into slavery, and so this is what happens to him. At, at the tender age of seventeen, he's sold into slavery into uh, Egypt and separated from his family. So he hadn't any, at this time he hadn't done anything other than to discuss what his dreams were, and they were upset with him. That's correct. And they're ready to to kill him. Yep, take him out. And as as a father might imagine, this would be very difficult for him. His his favored son was take, taken away from him. And they devised this plot saying he was killed by a wild animal and that coat of many colors was uh, dipped in sheep's blood and, or goat's mm. blood. And, and um, it was, so the father was deceived 
uh, in this way. And you must have been devastated by something like that. Yeah, very challenging. And you can imagine for Joseph, you know, for him thinking, you know, I've been doing what my father has wanted me to do. Uh, I've, I've shared um, the beliefs of my father. Why is this happening to me? Right. And so we find him in, in the next chapter in Egypt, actually two chapters over in, in chapter 39. And he finds himself um, on the slave auction block, and he is bought by Potiphar. And um, Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh's army. And God was with him. He, he watched over him and he preserves him, elevates him to um, a place of high status. And Joseph was an admirable person, and he caught the eye of Potiphar's wife. Um, and she attempted to seduce him, and he was able to withhold himself uh, from that. And we read specifically of what his response is in um, Genesis 39, verse 9. And he says to her, There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So he invokes his personal integrity that he's been raised to the status. He tries to show her what, what her place is and is an honored um, wife of, of Potiphar. And then he talks about his relationship with God and how he needs to defend that. And apparently this kind of thing goes on, it says in the next verse, day by day. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was a continuous kind of attempt to seduce him, right. but apparently he doesn't give in. No, and unfortunately it uh, has some bad consequences for Joseph because she eventually falsely accuses him and he's thrown into prison. So again, he may ask himself, why me? Why did this right. happen to me? Right. Um, so he finds himself in the prison and he is again, God is with him and he blesses him as we read in the first part of chapter 40. and. He runs into two of Pharaoh's um, his chief butler and his uh, and the chief baker. Russ, let me ask you a question. First sure. of all, uh, if you were accused of um, of having um, had relations with Potiphar's wife, I would think that one of the likelihoods would be that you'd be put to death, not thrown in prison. Right. Definitely, he had no rights as as a foreign slave. Uh, it would have been one thing if he was an Egyptian slave that might have imparted uh, some liberty to him, but. But being a foreigner, it most likely he would have been executed. So he was fa seen favorably um, in Potiphar's sight because God was with him and watching over him. I see. So already we can see God's hand protecting him even in this minor way. Right. Okay. Which at that, at that point in time, he would not have been able to necessarily see that. He right. would have only seen, as we all do, the negative. And it would have been as reflecting over his life, he would have been able to see the positive of that event. That's a good point. So he's now in Egypt in the, in the prison. Right. And he, he is faced with two more visions. These, these two employees of, of Pharaoh um, have visions. And he, in verse 8 of chapter 40, puts the emphasis where it belongs. He focuses that God is the one that is interpreting and watching over and ruling. And he says, uh, we have, they say unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpretation. And Joseph said unto them, Do not all interpretations belong to God? Tell me, I pray you. So he realizes that his dream, as well as theirs, were something that were sent by God. And one of them has a favorable interpretation and is restored to his post. And Joseph asks him to be remembered by him. The other is, does not receive a favorable interpretation and isn't put to death. And here again, the opportunity for him to say, why me? Because the one that was supposed to remember him in prison um, and bail him out, so to speak, um, forgets, forgets him. about him. And so he spends... Uh, many more years, two full years, in fact, uh, in prison. I guess there was a lesson even there that you shouldn't rely on any kind of thing that you try to, uh, to do to get yourself out of the prison or rely on another man to get you out of the prison. Yeah. He really had to learn to rely on God, didn't he? Yes. And, and we see this one final time uh, when he's, he has the opportunity. He's brought before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has these two dreams that are prophesying famine in the land. And again, jo Joseph three times over in the chapter focuses on God being the one that's able to interpret the dreams and to be able to deliver the land from this hardship. So as a result of this, of his faithful reliance on God, um, Pharaoh sees this and appreciates his uh, ability to um, understand the way that things work because of God's blessing on him and so elevates him to second in the land. Yeah, I, you know, the thing that's amazing about his faith is that he doesn't give up. 
No. Uh, you would expect in a situation like this that, you know, he would start complaining or that he might give up on God, but he doesn't seem to do that, does he? No, not at all. And these are, this is, this, this first part of his life here, this is the hardship that he goes through. And more often than not, it's easier for us in the midst of hardship to stay focused. And it's when things are good that we tend to back off and, you know, don't need God quite so much. It's, you know, it's, it's more me right. doing it. Right. And we see that in the, in the next part of his life, that doesn't happen to him. So at this point, he is, uh, he's been forgotten. He's still in prison. What happens at the, uh, at the next point? Um, he's, he's brought before Pharaoh to interpret these dreams. So he interprets okay. the dreams. Pharaoh sees this as a, as a wonderful thing. Uh, and that he sees that God is with him and elevates him to the second position in the land. Second in all of Egypt. In all of Egypt. Wow. And, and he gives him um, a daughter of one of the priests in the land to be his wife. That's so he's amazing. So he's not only been blessed with the power, he's also kind of married into it. So, so now he, I, I would imagine the Egyptians were probably the most powerful land at that time. So here you have a man who uh, had gone from uh, really uh, being a person who is thrown in a pit, he's gone into prison, um, and he's been falsely accused, and now he's second in all the land. Yep. It's amazing. And he, t so he's working in one of the most powerful nations in that time, second in command, and he takes it to a higher level. Wow. Because of what God's able to do with him. Um, and so the, the, the prophecy of the famine taking place um, happens. After there's, there's years of plenty, and then there are the years of famine. And so after a couple of years, the, the famine um, is in place and it spreads into the land of Canaan where his brethren are at. Now what was Joseph's role during the time of the famine? He was kind of like the um, secretary of state where he okay. took care of um, everything that was going on within, within the country itself and was making sure to store up in the time of plenty so that they would have enough for not only the nation, but for the surrounding areas that they could sell. And that's really how um, Egypt became a powerhouse in that area. Okay. So Jacob, Joseph's father, sends his brothers down into the land um, to, to buy grain. And so when they, when they arrive there, uh, we read about their arrival in um, chapter 42. And this is kind of him being able to... Um, see the fulfillment of, of his dream um, that he wouldn't have originally believed uh, possible because that, was, that happened some 22 years ago. He was 17 years old when he was brought out of the land and now he's um, a little over 30. He was 30 when he came uh, before Pharaoh. And so his brothers come in and um, they bow down to him in um, Genesis 42 verse 6 through 9. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people in the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down to uh, themselves before him with their face to the ground. And Joseph saw his brethren and knew them, but he made himself a stranger unto them and spake roughly unto them. And he said to them, Whence come ye forth? And they said, From the land of Canaan. So that just the, like the bowing down of the sheaves that he originally mm -hmm. had in his dream, he's seeing this um, fulfilled. These are the same brothers that that uh, conspired to put him into the pit, possibly kill him, and then eventually sold him off exactly. to slavery. And you'd think that you know Joseph wouldn't soon forgot that event, as well as his brothers themselves did not forget the event either, because he kind of runs them through the ringer, uh, so to speak. He challenges them um, twice over um, to kind of fess up to their faults and to realize the mistakes that they made. Here he, he disguises himself, he speaks roughly to them, um, sells them goods, puts their money back into their sacks, and they're just amazed by this. When they return home, they find that their money's been restored, plus they've got this life-saving grain that's been brought back to them. And so they, um, they, they were questioned by Joseph as to what was going on. Uh, Joseph asks, you know, who is your father? Do you have any other um, offspring? He finds out that he has a younger brother, Benjamin, and who he's looking forward to see. And he says, if you're going to come again, bring Benjamin. And he throws them all into prison. Mm. And he says, I'm going to send one of you back. And he lightens the sentence on them and says, okay, I'll just keep one of you and the rest of you can go. So his brother Simeon's stuck here in the land and they return uh, to their father. Okay, so he's got the upper hand at this point. Yeah. And that might have been the temptation for them, for him to use that and to, um, you know, punish them. 
And that wasn't his intent at all. He was trying to get them to learn because um, he has this higher purpose. He has this higher vision that he is, that it is ruling his life. So even though they saw him, they didn't recognize him or didn't think of him as being their brother. No, because the Egyptians culturally were very different uh, from the Canaanites. They, um, were, they wore makeup. They usually would shave uh, their heads. Um, they didn't have any facial hair. Uh, whereas the Canaanites, they were shepherds, um, they wore a different style of dress, they usually had beards, so they looked very different. Okay. And granted that they hadn't, see, he was a young boy when he was That's right, he was only away. 17 last they saw him, that's yeah. right. And he's probably now in his early 40s at this point. Coming close to that, yeah. So they return, they finally are able to convince their father, Jacob, that um, Benjamin has to come down with them, otherwise they're not going to be able to buy any grain. And for him, uh, I don't think he was totally, uh, he didn't totally buy in to the story that they originally gave him about the death of, of Joseph, because they don't trust his elder, they don't trust, ben, they don't trust Benjamin's older brothers with him. He's fearing that something bad is going to happen to him, and he's going to lose both the sons of one of his wives. Right. Um, so eventually he says, if it happens, it happens, and he is again himself required to rely on his faith. It's quite a difference for Jacob also. Jacob is a man that uh, didn't always trust everybody. A little bit of a, of a deceiver himself, isn't he? True. That happened um, with, uh, with his brother Esau, where he was uh, trying to take the birthright uh, right. for himself. That's right. So the, the brothers come back with Benjamin to Egypt. and What happens then? That's correct. Then Joseph sees them. And um, they go through a series of events where it would seem very strange to them. They were placed in their birth order when they were uh, sitting down at the table, and Benjamin was favored in, in receiving uh, more food than anyone else. And eventually, as they're retelling the story about what's going on in the land, he can't contain himself anymore. And he reveals himself and says, you know, I am, I am your, your brother Joseph. And they can't believe it. Must have scared him to death. It would have, it would have been a very big <laughs> shock for them. Yes. Um, and he reemphasizes to them that it wasn't not their doing. I mean, it, that, that God was able to use the events that took place to bring about the salvation of, of the people and of the land. And let's read about that real quick. Genesis 45, uh, starting at uh, verse 1 through 5. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brother, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you, that they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Mm. That's kind of like what we call a 2020 uh, vision, being able to look backwards. You know, right. it's kind of like 2020 hindsight, I think yeah. is a phrase, mm. uh, that he's able to look now back at his life and he's able to see that this was all, this all had to happen to put him in this position, right? Right. So he would have seen those challenges as much of a blessing. Like the mm. way that we look at things in our lives, the, the death of a loved one or a challenging circumstance that we might have, losing a job, um, those eventually can turn out to be very positive things in our life because without them we wouldn't change. If everything was going nice and steady, even keel, you know, we wouldn't be worried about anything that happens in our life. But right. it's only when we have those challenging circumstances that we're willing to change in our lives. Okay. Very good. So um, what does this all mean to us? Uh, you know, he was restored to his brethren. He gets to see the fulfillment of the dreams. Uh, he's able to see how God's hand had worked in his life. Uh, what does that mean for us today? Well, he had a very specific vision that was given to him. And uh, I believe that we have that same, or we have a similar vision mm -hmm. of something that we can look forward to in the future. Uh, we mentioned some of those other characters in the past, David, Samuel, etc., who had specific purposes that were laid out for them. And one of the best examples that we have of how to lead our lives is Christ. He was given a vision for him to look forward to. Let's turn over to, um, to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And we can see the 
uh, the vision uh, that he had that allowed him to endure the things that, uh, that he ran across. So Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's where he's at right now. But we're looking forward to him fulfilling a new and different role. And this is our vision. And we see this in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 32 through 33. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Something that we um, are all uh, looking forward to is those who are believing in Bible prophecy. And we see that these promises have not been fulfilled yet. Uh, we look over to uh, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7, verse 5. And it says, And he gave unto them none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it unto him for a possession and to his seed after him, when he as yet had no children. Specifically talking about Abraham, Joseph's great-great-grandfather. Um, so these promises to inherit the land were given to Jacob, or given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and passed on to Joseph and his children there. And they didn't receive it. They, didn't, they were sojourning in the land during that time. And Joseph was able to return the favor of providing a vision to the, the people there. And this is what he was remembered for in Hebrews chapter 11, that he gave specific instructions that he was not to, his final resting place should not be in the land of Egypt. They should take his bones and take him uh, into the land of Canaan, where they knew that that was their place that they should belong. So really, uh, the message is, is that all men and women of faith have had their, their very difficult trying times. Even the Lord Jesus Christ uh, had uh, the greatest sacrifice where he willingly gave his own life. But he did so with a vision of the future in front of him. And he was able to look beyond and to disesteem the things that were happening to him at that time mm -hmm. because of the great joy that lay in, in front of him. And that really, uh, I guess that is the, the key to understanding this message is that good things and bad things happen to us. Being able to look forward and to understand clearly the, um, the vision that we have of a better future that lies there for the believer. Right. It's what you do with it that's important. Because yes. he was able to take these challenges, find the good in them, keep his focus, and remain faithful to the commandments that God had given him. Well, uh, we hope certainly that we can... Uh, begin to uh, live up to that uh, standard that was lived to by, uh, by Joseph. Russ, thank you very much for your time here today. And friends, I suppose also that you too find that things happen in your life which make it difficult at times to, to really feel that, um, am I on the right track? But I think all of us can take some, some real pleasure in this message being able to understand that good things and bad will happen to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we can keep the vision of the kingdom ahead of us, then we can have a real solace and enthusiasm for the future. Please stay with us, and in just a moment, we'll have some information about a literature offer, and we thank you for your time. Please come back soon and see us. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, thisisyourbible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth.